Welcome back, folks. Welcome to lecture number 10. We are now firmly in the territory of alternating current. We are going to do a number of math problems today, and we are going to lean in on our calculator to understand inductors and capacitors. We'll start with a quick review. Let voltage as a function of time equal 650 cosine of 377t minus 120 degrees. We identified this as a peak voltage. We said this was omega, which is equal to 2 pi f. In this case, 377 is equal to 2 pi f, giving a frequency of 377 divided by 2 divided by pi of 60 hertz. And we said this was a phase shift. On your note card, you should have this equation, that the RMS voltage is equal to the peak voltage divided by root 2. In this case, it's 650 over the square root of 2. So our voltage is 650 divided by square root of 2 gives us 460 volts RMS. When we put this together, we see that the voltage is equal to 460 volts RMS at a phase angle of negative 120 degrees. We could express that in the time domain, drawing a sinusoid as a function of time. But for today, we are going to use the phasers. So we have the real axis, we have the imaginary axis, and this particular vector, this phaser, is located right there. It has an angle of negative 120 degrees with respect to the real axis, and it has a length of 460 volts RMS. Moving on is the closely related topic of inductive and capacitive reactants. We can say the inductive reactance is equal to 2 pi f l, where f is the frequency of the circuit and l is the inductance of the physical device. For the capacitor, the capacitive reactance is equal to 1 over 2 pi f c, where f is the frequency that the circuit is operating at and C is the capacitance. Again, this is reactance. Not to be confused with impedance. You may recall this diagram here where we talked about the real piece and the imaginary piece. And we said inductors live up here, capacitors are negative creatures, and resistors live on the real axis. Well, this is the impedance chart. We would say the impedance of the inductor is the inductive reactance at a phase angle of 90 degrees. Another way of saying that is that the inductive impedance is J times the inductive reactance. And we have the same situation with a capacitor, where the impedance of a capacitor is equal to negative J by the capacitive reactance. You could think of it this way. The reactance tells you the length of the vector, and impedance tells you the length and direction of the vector. Again, another name for vector is phasor. We have one more thought, and then we're going to tie this all together. You recall series and parallel circuits for resistors? We said the total resistance in a series circuit is R1 plus R2, plus, and in general, out to the nth resistor. For parallel resistors, we say 1 over the total resistance is equal to 1 over R1, plus 1 over R2, plus as many resistors as you have. This thought will also work for impedance. Now we would say the total impedance 
is equal to the summation of the individual impedances for a series circuit. And you'll notice we're putting a bar over the impedance to signify that it is a vector. You can see that that has the same form for both resistance and for impedance. It's similar for the parallel piece. We say 1 over the total parallel impedance is equal to 1 over impedance 1 plus the reciprocal of impedance 2 plus as many impedances as you might have. While we've got our note cards out, one other thing. There was this thing called Ohm's Law. That's still with us, but it's transformed ever so slightly. Now we talk about a voltage phasor, we talk about a current phasor, and we talk about an impedance phasor. There's even the power. I'm not going to get into this today, but we'll write it down anyway. So there's your pi wheel. This is transformed into complex power, the complex conjugate of current, and the voltage vector. All righty, folks. At this point, you are in AC circuits. Kind of uncomfortable right now, but you're ready to start the calculations. We're going to work a couple of examples. I'll walk you through step by step by step, and in each step, we'll perform the calculations on our calculator. So let's start with this circuit. This is a series circuit. It has a 120 volt source, a 10 ohm resistor, and a 22 millihenry inductor. As we start, you're going to have to be careful. Notice that the units on the resistor are ohms, and the units on the inductor are millihenrys. Those are not compatible. What you have to do is calculate the impedance of the inductor. So that's your opening move. To do that, you first calculate the reactance of the inductor, and that was 2 pi f is 60 hertz in this case, that's our frequency, by 0 0.022, so that's 22 millihenries. That gives us a reactance of, because we calculate it here, 2 times 2 times pi times 60 times 0 0.022. So that's 8.3 ohms. So we can say this is 8.3 ohms at an angle. You've got to remember what angle that is. And we said that inductors lived here, and resistors lived there, and capacitors lived down there. So in this case, the angle is at 90 degrees. Another way of saying that is simply to say that the impedance is J 8.3. Why do we use J? Well, we use J because I was already taken. Okay, let's just write that down here just so we don't forget. The impedance of the inductor was 8.3 phase angle of 90 degrees, which is the same as saying J 8.3 ohms. Since this is a series circuit, the total impedance is the sum of the individual pieces, which means this is 10 plus J 8.3 ohms. We would call this notation rectangular because it says go over 10 units there and then go up 6, and the junction of those two is what the impedance of this circuit is. So it has a real component and it has an imaginary component. Moving on, we can calculate the current in the circuit as the voltage divided by the impedance. In this case, our voltage was 120. You'll notice there's no angle there. So we can assume that's 120 at a phase angle of zero degrees. And that's all over 10 plus J 8.3. So 
So now we've got to go to our calculator and figure out how to do these complex numbers. To do that, we go setup and then two for complex. Now, a couple things you need to have working on your calculator. That small writing right there should say complex, and you want to make sure you're in degrees. So now here's how you enter these numbers. One, two, zero, shift, and right here, you can just barely make it out. There's a little, I think it's in purple, an angle symbol. So there's angle of zero. You enter that. And of course, because the angle is zero, it's just 120. Now you divide that by 10 plus 8.3, and then the symbol here, it's in purple, J. Close the print, and your answer is 7.1 minus J5.9. Okay, so that is the current in amperes in rectangular. While that's true, that's not what your current meter would actually read. Instead, we need to shift this to polar mode. So shift, complex, and then this one right here, three. Here's our answer in polar mode. So 9.2 amps at a phase angle of negative 40 degrees. So if you were to use your meter, your true RMS meter, you would read 9.2 amps in this circuit. So again, if you were to insert your meter right there, it would read 9.2 amps. While we're here, let's see if we can use the voltage divider to calculate the voltage on R1. So the voltage divider tells us the voltage of interest is equal to the resistor of interest over the total resistance by the source. If we were to convert that into our phasor notation, we would say the voltage of interest is equal to the impedance of interest over the total impedance by the source. Okay, not much change there. So we want the voltage on R1. We said that's the impedance of interest. I believe that was 10 ohms, right? Yep, so 10 ohms. That's 10 over the total impedance which is 10 plus J8.3. And all that multiplied by 120 volts. So the voltage on R1 is equal to 10 divided by pren 10 plus 8.3J. And then you multiply that by 120. And I'm going to shift it into polar form, because that is what your meter would read. So what your meter would read is 92 volts at a phase angle of negative 40 degrees. So hold that thought. We can also calculate the voltage on the inductor. So the voltage on L1 is equal to J8.3 over 10 plus J 8.3 by 120. So the voltage on L1 is equal to, let's see if we can work that, so parenthesis, 8.3J divided by parenthesis 10 plus 8.3J times 120. And again, we're going to put that into rectangular mode. Correction, we're going to put that into polar mode because that's what your meter would read. So that would be 76, actually we'll call it 77, volts at a phase angle of 50 degrees. Now isn't that interesting? Because there was something that told us that the summation of the voltages, right, the source voltage, better be equal to the voltage on the resistor and the voltage on the inductor. Let's see if that's true. So we have 92 at a phase angle of negative 40 plus 77 at a phase angle of 50. And if we've done this right, this will be very close to 120 volts at angle zero. 
and it is, we'll put it into polar mode again, very close to 120 volts. So volt source is indeed 120 volts. That's RMS. At this point, I'd encourage you to stop the video, go back to when we started, and work these problems with your calculator until you get a feel for how it works. It's not that it's overly complex, it just takes a little while to get used to your calculator. And then we can work another example. As before, we look at the units and we say ohms, millihenries, and microfarads are not the same units. We can't just add these up. Instead, we're going to have to calculate the impedance of the inductor and the impedance of the capacitor. X of L is equal to 2 pi by 60, because it's 60 hertz, by 0 0.025 and xc is equal to 1 over 2 pi 60 by 1300 microfarad. You can solve the inductor with the calculator. 2 times pi times 60 times 0 0.025. So that is approximately 9.5. 4 ohms. Again, this is the reactance. This is not impedance. The impedance has direction. So the impedance is 9.4 ohms at a phase angle of 90 degrees, or another way of saying that is just J9.4. And that's what we'll put up here. So we'll call it J9.4. We solve the capacitor the same way. So 2 times pi times 60 times 1300. This button down here is useful. It does x10x, so we push that, and then we say negative 6 because it's micro. And then we invert that. So we see our capacitor has a reactance of about 2 ohms. The impedance of the capacitor will be negative j2. So we can write that up here, negative J2. From there, we solve for the total impedance. Total impedance is 4 plus J9.4 minus J2, giving a total impedance of 4 plus J7.4. And that is in ohms. From there, source current is easy to calculate. That is a voltage over an impedance. And what was our voltage? We said 208 volts. So that's 208 over 4 plus J7.4, which gives us a current of, go to the calculator again, so 208 divided by 4 plus 7.4 J, and we're going to put this into polar form because that's what the meter reads. And that works out to about 25 amps at a phase angle of negative 62 degrees. Your calculator may have many more digits than this. And that can sometimes get annoying. If you want to take care of that, go Shift, Setup. And then this button here, 6, is for fixed, and maybe only display you know, four significant figs. There, that's a little bit better. Let's try that again. So shift, setup, um, fix, and 4. There we go. Let's work one more example and then move on to a few other things. This time we have a current source 
and then we have three elements that are in parallel. As we get started, again, we look at the units, and we see that ohms, microfarads, and millihenries are not the same units. We're going to have to do some manipulation before we can use them. The capacitive reactance is calculated as 1 over 2 pi F C. You can run that through your calculator. I think you'll find that it is 26.5 ohms. The inductor is 2 pi 60 0 0.01. And again, I'll let you run that through your calculator. You should find that that's about 3.77 ohms. We can move these numbers upstairs. And as we do it, we're going to say negative J 26.5 for the capacitor. So we've taken the reactance and we've said it's now a capacitive impedance. So that's a negative creature, negative J, 26.5. And we've done the same thing with the inductor, except inductors are positive. So J, 3.77 ohms. The total impedance is calculated as 1 over C total. is equal to 1 over 10 plus 1 over negative J, 26.5 plus 1 over J, 3.77. Now that looks scary, but again, your calculator will take care of it for you. So let's give it a try. I recommend you put parentheses around every number at first. So here's 10, and then we're going to invert it, plus parentheses, negative 25.6J, invert, plus pren, 3.77j, parenthesis invert, equals, invert, equals. So there we go. The total impedance is 1.62 plus j 3.68 ohms. So if you were to look into that circuit, you would see a resistor and an inductor, 1.62 ohms here, and 3.68 correction, and J, 3.68 ohms there. Well, since we're here, we may as well get some more experience using our calculator. So let's calculate the current on R1. We'll use the current divider rule. So that told us that a current of interest is equal to the total parallel piece over the resistor of interest by the source. Well, that just changes here to using impedances. So the impedance, or the total impedance is right there. We said 1.62 plus J3.68. So 1.62 plus J3.68 over the resistor which is 10 multiplied by the current, which we, what did we say the current was? Oh, we didn't. It was defined. It was given as 32 amps. Oh, get dizzy going back and forth so often. So the current on R1, and that's a vector, is, so I think it's still in the calculator memory. Well, we'll key it in anyway. So print 1.62 plus 3.68j divided by 10 multiplied by 32. We're going to put that into polar. There we go. So that is 12.9 amps at a phase angle of 66.2 degrees. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to figure out what the current on the capacitor is and figure out what the current on the inductor is. And when you have all three of these values and you take the summation, they better equal 32 amps. I'll give you a hint. This one here is at an angle of 156 degrees and this is at an angle of negative 23.8 degrees.
So again, I encourage you to calculate this value right here and that value right there using the current divider rule. It's a good experience with your calculator. All right, that finishes AC for today. Before we leave, I wanted to talk about conversion. Specifically, conversions between AC to DC. So we have AC in, DC out, DC to DC. It's a magic box. It takes DC in, gives you a different direct current out. And finally, DC to AC. Again, another magic box. This one, it takes DC in and gives you AC out. Now, you probably recognize some of these. This here would be your cell phone charger. It takes AC from the wall and converts it into DC. You likely own many DC to DC converters, but they tend to be smaller and built into the actual devices that you're using. You may own one of these inverters. For example, if you have something that plugs into your car cigarette lighter and then gives you 120 volts out, that is an inverter. And the reason I bring these up is to keep an old thread alive. And that thread deals with efficiency. So efficiency is power out over power in. So we can talk about a system like this, perhaps, where you have a battery. And then you have a DC to AC. And then out here, you have a 400 watt load. If you were told that this was a 12 volt battery, and if you knew the efficiency of this converter was 90%, could you calculate the battery current? I think you could, because you've got everything you need. The problem looks something like this. We have a power flow diagram. We know there are 400 watts out. We know that the power in is 12 times something. And we know the efficiency is equal to 90%. Remember, efficiency is power out over power in. In this case, 0 0.9 is equal to 400 over the power in which means the power in is equal to about 440 watts. So 440 watts goes in. That means we must lose about 40 watts in the process. And if you look right there, you might know another equation that will be helpful for you. And that is power is equal to IE. So 440 is equal to some current by 12 which means our current is about 37 amps. So that was a review of efficiency. Again, that is a thread that we're going to keep alive in this class because at some point in the near future, we are going to encounter something called a variable frequency drive. What it does is it takes in AC voltage, converts it to DC. We have a large storage capacitor here to smooth everything out. And then we take DC and we convert it back into AC to drive a motor. Except this time, this AC, you can change the frequency, which means you can change the speed of the motor. I bring up efficiency because we're going to chain these together. We're going to talk about the efficiency of the motor, and then we can talk about the efficiency of the variable frequency drive. When you come back for next class, we're going to spend more time working these alternating current circuits. For now, I recognize that it's a rather uncomfortable place to be, but please work the problems. Work them with your calculator. Get to know your calculator and how to enter those numbers very quickly. And I think it will come with time. So just hang in there and keep working the problems.